Hello, everyone. Welcome to an year in GCP networking. I'm Shubhika Taneja, and I'm a product marketing manager here at Google Cloud. I have with me Zach Siles, who is a networking specialist customer engineer. And we are also thrilled to have Nick Jakes joining us from one of the leading US, re uh, US retailers, Target. Nick is a lead engineer at Target, and he'll be sharing with us how Target uses GCP with an emphasis on networking products and services. Thank you. So with that, let's get started. We'll also leave a few minutes of live Q&A in the end. In case your questions don't get answered, please feel free to use Dory in your apps. That will be open throughout the week, and we'll continue answering questions over there. And lastly, th these conferences bring a big crowd all under the same roof, and we love to hear back from you. This session is an yearly series, so please spend a couple of minutes giving us a survey in the end so that we can continue to improve our content. So Newton gave us three laws of motion. If there were an equivalent three laws of cloud, networking would be one of those. Because without the network, there is no cloud. You might be wondering, why am I opening this session with this slide? It is because it's the emphasis on the infrastructure that has let Google scale the way we have, which is depicted by our own cloud services that you see here, eight different apps with a billion users each. One of the core differentiators that acts as a fundamental backbone of these apps is our network. And at GCP, our goal has been to give access to our customers to this same network. Now let's look at some of the global infrastructure numbers around the world, which is very important for the customer. We have 19 regions that are live today. We will be launching new regions in Jakarta, Indonesia, Osaka, Japan. And if you saw the keynote this morning, Sundar announced two more regions in Seoul and Salt Lake City. We also have 134 POPs, or points of presence. These are the points where the traffic is exchanged between Google's network and the public internet. It shouldn't come as a surprise. We have 30 renewable energy project locations. We match 100% of the energy that we consume with renewable energy to, con to maintain our commitment to being carbon neutral. Nine years ago, Google became the first major non-telco to invest in subsea cables. We have had 13 subsea cable investments since then, including two private cables that were announced last year. So the key takeaway here is that these numbers continue to grow between what you saw last year and today. And these, the infrastructure helps our customers deliver their services closer to their users. Now, when you think about the networking product portfolio, there are two elements I want you to think about. The first one is the infrastructure that you just got a sneak peek into. And this is something that our customers get by default when they move to Google Cloud. The second piece is our products and services that the customers can consume. There are over 20 products in our portfolio. Not everything is shown over here. Zach and I will walk you through the advancements that we have made across these products, which can be broadly broken down into five pillars, connect, scale, optimize, secure, and modernize. In the interest of time, we won't be able to cover the advancements made in the last one year across all, each and every advancement. But our, take, our goal from this session is for you to walk away with a fundamental understanding of our products so that then you can pick deep dive sessions for specific products that you are interested in learning more over the next two days. So with that, let's get started with Connect. Our goal here is to ensure that we are enabling our customers to connect to Google Cloud on their terms, which means offering hybrid connectivity options, flexible hybrid connectivity options. We offer Cloud Interconnect, which comes in two flavors, dedicated interconnect and partner interconnect. If you can meet Google at one of our 81 dedicated interconnect locations, you can opt for that. Or if you cannot meet us there, or you prefer to work with a partner, you can opt for partner interconnect. Both the options offer flexible bandwidth between 50 meg and 10 gig, and industry-leading SLAs of four nines of uptime. We also offer Cloud VPN for lower bandwidth requirements and lower cost. Both Cloud Interconnect and Cloud VPN are coming up with interesting announcements tomorrow, so stay tuned for that. The last option is peering, which you can also use to connect to Google Cloud. Now, over the past one year, we have added several new partners for Partner Interconnect. So I'm sure you saw something like this last year in this session as well. We continue to add more partners to our ecosystem. Currently, we have over 50 partners that can help our customers get on-ramped to Google Cloud. Next, on the Connect pillar, let's talk about VPC, 
First of all, what is VPC? VPC stands for Virtual Private Cloud. It is your own piece of logically isolated and secure Google Cloud. It resembles the traditional network, but with the benefits of scalable infrastructure. Now, what's unique about our global VPC is that it uses the same backbone that we have built for our own products, like Google Search, YouTube that you saw earlier. And that enables our customers to create VMs anywhere in the world across any of our 19 regions and have private connectivity between them by default. So the customers don't need to set up any VPN connections or peering connections or give their VMs external IPs. This reduces the toil of sprawl and config and truly enables our customers to have global access to their workloads. And that's what we mean when we say 19 regions, one VPC. Now, on VPC, we have announced two key uh, advancements in the last one year. The first one is private access for GCP services. This is a new framework that provides private connectivity between your VPC network and the service that you're communicating to. Cloud SQL is the first GCP service to use this framework. The VM instances in your VPC network and the network, the service that you're talking to, uh, communicate via the internal RFC 1918 IP addresses. And once you set up this connectivity, any number of GCP services can use that connection. So again, to summarize, it reduces the, the uh, toil of management and setup to talk to GCP services. The second uh, advancement that we have made on, on the VPC side is the private Google access for on-prem. This enables your on-prem hosts to reach Google APIs and services through a cloud VPN tunnel or a cloud interconnect connection. So you can leverage your existing private connection to Google Cloud for this. And that also means that you can take advantage of VPC service controls that Zach will cover later. It does not require your on-prem hosts to have external IP addresses. Next on the connect pillar, I want to talk about uh, the D cloud DNS. We have added two capabilities on cloud DNS in the last one year. First one is private zones, and the second one is DNS forwarding. Private zones provides a simple to manage internal DNS solution for your private networks on GCP. This removes the, uh, basically the need to provision and manage any additional resources or compute resources, simplifying management for networking administrators. Now, as you can see in this animation, the DNS queries for private zones, myenterprise.com, it will just show up, are restricted to your internal network. And any DNS queries for that from the hostile agent on the right from public internet get denied, because this is a private network. Now, a key part of a successful hybrid cloud strategy is that you should be able to find your resources easily, whether they are on-prem or on cloud. DNS forwarding lets you link your on-prem and cloud environments easily. You can set up bi-directional forwarding zones between your on-prem name servers and GCP's internal name servers. As you can see in the animation, on the outbound, outbound forwarding, uh, it lets your GCP resources use your existing on-prem DNS servers. And on the inbound forwarding, it lets your on-prem resources use uh, the cloud DNS to resolve domains. With that, we wrap up the connect pillar, and we are now going to move to optimize. We GA'd network service tiers last month. Some of you may have seen that announcement come through. Network service tiers lets our customers customize the underlying network and, and basically optimize it for performance or cost. So if you are using Google Cloud today, you're most likely using our premium tier network. The premium tier delivers traffic over Google's well-provisioned, low-latency, highly reliable global network, which we saw earlier. But for some case cases, customers may prefer standard tier, which is a cheaper, lower performance alternative, but it is still comparable in performance to other public clouds. Most cloud providers use what is called hot potato routing, which you see on the bottom here, which means when you try to send traffic on their network, it gets offloaded to the public internet as soon as possible. Whereas we use cold potato routing that you see on the top, we keep that traffic on Google's private network for as long as possible, and it usually exits the public internet as close as possible to the end user, usually in the same city or town. And that enables us to provide better reliability, higher security, and higher performance. Sidex is an internet performance monitoring and optimizations tools company, which is now part of Citrix, did some performance comparisons. 
And as expected, the premium tier is 1.7x times faster than the standard tier. So on the top is the throughput from the premium tier in green, which is what you get from our premium tier network. And on the bottom in the blue is the standard tier throughput, which is what you get from our standard tier and most other public clouds. And you can get these numbers online on, CIDEC, on the website of CIDEXIS. So that wraps up Optimize. I would next like to move into the scale pillar, which includes cloud load balancing and cloud CDN. Before we talk about the different advancements that we have made in cloud load balancing, I would first like to talk about how Google does global load balancing. Load balancers in most other public clouds are regional. So that means you have a single VIP or virtual IP per region, and then you have backend instances in those regions as well. Now, regions are silos. So the load balancer in one region cannot use the capacity of load balancer in another region. Whereas with Google Global Load Balancing, you can have your application instances running anywhere in the world across any of our 19 regions, but you get a single VIP or virtual IP to front end all those backend instances. So that way, the customers get full global capacity and cross-region failover. It's also closely tied to the autoscaler that scales up or down your backend instances based on inline traffic. So as you can see, this again helps our customers deliver their services closer to their end users and scale up or down in line with traffic. With that, let's take a look at some of the advancements that we have made on our load balancers. We offer five different flavors of load balancers. And there are a lot of capabilities that we have announced across uh, these, these different flavors over the last one year. I won't have the time to cover all of those. There is a deep dive session on our load balancers tomorrow if you are interested in more details. I've just handpicked a few here. On our internal load balancer, we now support all ports, which basically takes away the earlier requirement of five ports, very useful for users who want to manage multiple layer four applications. Also, the internal load balancer now reduces the, uh, the, the management and the config setup by supporting DNS-based service discovery. On the HTTPS load balancer front, we now support user-defined request headers, which basically insert client information, uh, the geolocation, or the RTT, and then send it to the backend instances. And lastly, in order to continue our commitment of making the internet faster, on the HTTPS load balancer, we support the QUIC and the HTTP2 protocols. So if your applications are latency sensitive, they are going to see a boost of performance as, as a result of that integration. On the Google Cloud CDN, last year we went GA with large object support, allowing you to cache and serve video and other content up to 5 terabytes in size. So with that, I talked about connect, optimize, and scale pillars. And I would like to invite Zach to talk about secure and modernized pillars next. Thanks, Shubhika. Let's jump right into the secure pillar. We have a number of key advancements over the last 12 months that I want to cover today. So historically, when you wanted to store your sensitive data inside of a Google Cloud managed service, you had a set of credentials that were tied to an IAM role that actually determined whether or not a user could access that data. So for example, if you're storing your data in Google Cloud Storage, access control is primarily dictated by which roles a particular user or a set of credentials have. This could open up your organization to some weaknesses. For example, what if the IAM roles are misconfigured, providing more access than you intended? What if those IAM credentials are compromised? They're maybe leaked publicly or somehow get into the hands of somebody who's not supposed to have them. And lastly, what if you have an instance, a virtual machine inside of your environment that gets compromised and somebody leverages that compromised instance to try and exfiltrate data from your VPC environment? In addition to this, traditional network controls, so access lists that are restricting access based on IP addresses and protocols, don't provide complete protection because most Google services are exposed from an accessibility perspective over the same infrastructure, leveraging the same protocols. As you've experienced when you're accessing our APIs across a number of Google products, it's almost always TLS encrypted HTTP traffic. So just relying on the network controls themselves didn't provide enough protections. And to solve this problem, we developed VPC service controls. This is now available. It was released in the last 12 months. VPC service controls provide you with the ability to actually uh, permit or deny at a per, on a per-project basis 
access to Google Managed Service APIs based on the origin of the request. So this, in combination with the proper credentials and the network access controls, allow you to basically define an explicit security perimeter around your projects and networks inside of Google Cloud across which data cannot transfer. So for example, if your intended policy is that you want to create a Google Cloud storage bucket and store your data in that bucket inside of a project, but you don't want to allow access from the public internet to that bu bucket, you can do that with VPC service controls, even if those users on the internet have the right credentials. So VPC service control is very, very powerful, provides you with API level controls to add the origin of the request to the existing suite of controls to control access to data that you store inside of Google's managed services. Next, we have Cloud Armor. Cloud Armor allows you to protect your internet facing load balanced workloads inside of Google Cloud. This includes protecting you from a variety of distributed denial of service attacks. And this leverages the same protections that Google has developed over the past 20 years to make sure that our own services, Drive, Gmail, Search, et cetera, remain available and scalable on a global basis. Cloud Armor is integrated with Google Cloud load balancing and provides you the ability to implement these controls at the edge of Google's network. So when Shubhika talked about our global backbone and leveraging our premium network where your users come onto Google's network as close to the user as possible, Cloud Armor allows you to implement controls to determine from both layer seven all the way through, sorry, layer three, so traditional network controls, all the way through layer seven, what users are able to access your load balanced workloads. So Cloud Armor is available now publicly as well. Next, we have Cloud NAT. This was probably one of the most frequently requested capabilities from customers, and we've made this available now in the last 12 months. Traditionally, when you deploy resources, applications, virtual machines inside of the cloud, you want to protect those systems from direct access from the public internet. At the same time, um, yeah, so Cloud, CloudNet solves this problem for you um, by implementing a regional CloudNet gateway that allows you to control access, outbound access from those virtual machines or your applications uh, in an efficient manner on a per region basis. There's a number of key benefits to our CloudNet implementation. First, it's a completely software-driven distributed implementation. So the actual NAT capabilities are built into the fabric of the VPC itself. So there's no device that you have to force traffic through from a NAT perspective. There's no risk of potential choke points from a performance perspective because it's a com completely distributed system. Second, we give you the control over whether Google manages the public IP addresses as you scale up and down the number of translations that need to happen for traffic destined to the internet or whether you explicitly define through static IP reservations in your projects which public IP addresses are associated with NAT. The latter case being very common, for example, if you're establishing outbound connections to partners and those partners need to whitelist the source IP addresses that you're coming from. You have a configuration choice there. Google can manage those addresses for you or you can specify through static reservations which public IP addresses your services present themselves as on the public internet. And finally, um, a single CloudNAT gateway can support an entire region regardless of scale. So if you have 100 virtual machines in a region, if you have 15,000 virtual machines in a region, irrespective of the number of VMs, irrespective of the volume of traffic that's going out towards the internet from that particular region, you only need a single CloudNAT gateway. And again, this goes back to the uniqueness in the architecture and the distributed way in which we implement these capabilities. So CloudNAT is the third key capability in the secure pillar that we want to talk about today. Next, we have two capabilities, or sorry, next we have Google Managed Certificates. So Google has a history of leveraging TLS encryption whenever possible. Um, if you remember several years ago, we actually let the ability for websites who are using HTTPS to improve their search result rankings, right? So you're using encrypted transport on the internet, you're, that actually inf influences search page results. At the same time, we also made the Chrome browser explicitly kind of identify when websites were not using TLS changing the standard expectation of users to assume that all websites should be using TLS encryption and visually actually identifying when websites do not. So really kind of changing the approach there. At the same time within cloud, we're constantly trying to make things easier for customers to deploy and manage. And for this, we have made available in the last year, Google Managed Certificates. So with Google Managed Certificates, when you create an internet facing HTTPS load balancer, as part of that provisioning, you can select to have Google automatically procure 
and configure the certificate for the domains that are supporting that particular load balancer instance. In addition, this capability automatically handles certificate renewal when required and will automatically revoke the certificates when you delete the load balancer. So this now allows you to basically have complete hands-off TLS implementation for your internet-facing load balancers through Google Managed Certificates. In addition, regardless of how you host your backends, whether those are on compute instance VMs or, as, or backed from a workload perspective on Kubernetes pods, both types are supported with this, with this capability. So really making kind of the default stance of TLS encrypted load balancing um, very easy for you to manage and deploy. The next two capabilities fall under kind of the area we consider to be network telemetry. And the first one is called VPC flow logs. So having visibility, obviously, to traffic inside of the cloud network is a common request of customers. This is something that I think customers have kind of uh, become accustomed to in their on-premise network environments. And so for traffic that's, tra that's traversing your VPC inside of Google Cloud, whether it stays solely within the VPC, say, between different virtual machines inside of Google Cloud, or whether it's virtual machines that are talking to resources out on the public internet, you can now enable VPC flow logs to get identifying information about that traffic streamed into StackDriver from a visibility perspective. So if you have a background in networking, this is pretty analogous to NetFlow from your on-prem networking with some really great additional features. Namely that not only do we actually sample the traffic to determine the traditional network um, information from that traffic, so source and destination IP addresses, what protocols are used, what ports, we then annotate that information with more, I'll say, human-friendly information. So we add the project information, the actual virtual machine instance names, the VPC that that instance is deployed in. And if the communication is actually from an instance, a virtual machine inside of your VPC to the public internet, we'll actually annotate those logs to tell you the geographic information of what they're talking to. So you're talking to an endpoint that may be in Sao Paulo, Brazil, as an example. So these annotations allow us to basically tell, add additional information that we know about the flow to those flow records. This information is streamed natively by default to StackDriver logging. You can also stream it into BigQuery for analytics. Or if you're using your own on-premise or external logging analytics capabilities, you can actually stream the logs to those through Cloud PubSub. So pretty powerful capability here. In a similar fashion, we've also released in the last 12 months logging for the VPC, native VPC firewall. So you can now enable on a per VPC firewall rule basis the ability to enable logging. So as traffic comes through the VPC and matches these firewall rules, we'll generate logs in a very similar manner that we do for VPC flow logging. So you now have the ability from a compliance perspective, as an example, to actually prove to auditors that you're blocking traffic that you say you're gonna block. This is like VPC flow logs available natively for streaming into StackDriver logging. Again, also with BigQuery or to external systems through Cloud PubSub. So two things with network telemetry to give you vis better visibility into the cloud network environment for both traffic flowing across your VPC, but also for um, traffic flowing through the native VPC firewall. So those, those are some of the key uh, capabilities from a secure perspective. Now moving on to modernize. We're going to talk specifically here about Google Kubernetes Engine and some stuff that we're doing around Istio. So Google Kubernetes Engine, if you're not familiar, is Google's managed instance of Kubernetes which is our production-ready um, solution for deploying containerized applications. Over the past year, we've implemented a number of capabilities that allow us to more tightly inter integrate GKE clusters with the best of cloud-native networking inside of Google Cloud. So the power that we have in terms of global reach around our VPCs, as well as the native high-performance routing, that's now integrated directly into Google Kubernetes Engine. And we do this through something we call VPC native clusters, which basically takes the networking that is typically implemented as an overlay inside of Kubernetes and actually makes that a fundamental part of the underlying VPC network. So this is good not only from a visibility and from a routing perspective, because we now, for example, treat pods and services the same way we treat virtual machines from a reachability perspective. But it also improves the security, where we have strong kind of anti-spoofing measures that are deployed inside of the network that are natively integrated inside of GKE. This provides additional capabilities when we look at integrating networking into your on-premise environments or hybrid networking, because again, the capabilities that are enabled as part of your VPC from a routing and visibility perspective are also now available for your Kubernetes clusters. So very powerful capabilities with, re with respect to GKE. 
Also for GKE, we've released something called container native load balancing. This is currently in beta. So in the past, when a load balancer, like an external load balancer, like our Google Cloud load balancer, targeted resources inside of a Kubernetes cluster, you'd have a situation somewhat similar to this, right? You have multiple nodes inside of your Kubernetes cluster. The load balancer actually targets the nodes or the virtual machine instances as the backends for, those, for the load balancer. Now on those nodes, you may have a disproportionate number of pods in Kubernetes. You could even have a situation where some of those no nodes don't actually have the pods that you're targeting from the load balancing perspective scheduled on that node. And in that case, IP tables or cube proxy on those Kubernetes nodes was responsible for a second level of load balancing. So the external load balancer gets the traffic to the node. IP tables or cube proxy inside of Kubernetes is responsible for then getting the traffic to the direct pod that you're trying to communicate with. This is commonly known in the Kubernetes community as a double hop problem. You basically have two layers of load balancing. This is especially problematic if you look at something like a regional Kubernetes cluster, where you have the actual nodes for the GKE cluster spread across multiple zones inside the region. The external load balancer could send that traffic to a node in zone A, as an example. And IP tables in that node in zone A could then decide it's going to actually load balance that traffic to a pod that's running on a node inside of zone B or C or D, right? So that second level of load balancing can add not only higher latency, but for a regional cluster, it can add additional costs because you're paying for the traffic that goes between the different zones inside of a region. So now with container native load balancing, we've, internet, we've introduced something called network endpoint groups. And essentially here what we're doing is we're allowing the pods to basically behave as if they're virtual machines from a networking perspective inside of the VPC. So instead of the Kubernetes nodes actually being the target of the load balancer, it's in fact the pods themselves that are the direct target of the external load balancer. So when traffic comes in from your users to our external load balancer, the load balancer looks at not the backends from a node perspective inside of Kubernetes, it actually sends the traffic directly to the Kubernetes pods themselves. So you remove essentially the second hop of load balancing. This improves latency and can actually reduce costs for traffic going between zones inside of a regional cluster. So container native load balancing, very powerful as well. Also for GKE, we've actually provided the ability now to integrate um, the load balancing capabilities in GKE with some of our cloud native capabilities, particularly with our content delivery network, Cloud CDN, Identity Aware Proxy, IAP, and Cloud Armor, which I talked about a few slides ago. Now you can configure and, clune, configure and tune these capabilities directly from within Kubernetes manifest or configuration files. And the way we do this is with a concept called backend config. You can use backend config to configure these native services, so CDN, IAP, uh, Cloud Armor, et cetera, independent of Kubernetes ingress, which defines a web-based load balancer, or services. So you don't have to keep overloading the existing Kubernetes constructs with annotation and other things that need to be approved by the broader Kubernetes com community to integrate with Google Cloud native capabilities. So with backend config, you now have the ability to specify independently of ingress and services integration with these native Google Cloud services, and then you pair those two things together. So for example, an external web-based load balancer that you may establish, you may instantiate it as a Kubernetes ingress can now also integrate natively with Cloud CDN, can now also integrate natively with IAP, and can now also integrate natively with Cloud Armor. So very powerful capabilities from a Kubernetes perspective. Now moving on to Istio. So if you haven't heard about Istio, which I imagine most of you have, Istio is an open source service mesh. It's heavily inspired by a lot of internal systems at Google, but it is developed in co collaboration with a number of external partners, including IBM and Lyft, the ride-sharing company, from a open source perspective. It essentially provides a way for you to build a service mesh between your different microservices um, that includes load balancing, it includes very fine-grained telemetry and monitoring capabilities, and also allows you to implement service-to-service -service network based authentication, so mutual TLS authentication, and allows you to do all of these things transparently without making any code changes directly to your application code. So it essentially provides an ability for you to abstract away all of these common capabilities in the cloud environment without having to repetitively implement these in terms of your application code. Now, what we've released in the last year is you can now, with a single click or a single flag in the CLI, you can actually 
provision Istio as an add-on for your GKE clusters. When you do this, what happens is we automatically deploy the Istio control plane. The Istio control plane is made up of a number of services. Pilot, which handles the actual traffic policies for how, which traffic goes where. Mixer, which handles telemetry, the visibility we talked about, and policy controls. And Citadel, which handles automatic certificate provisioning and revocation. All these together are deployed in your GKE cluster. And not only are they deployed with one click, but for the ongoing upgrade life of those control plane services, we automatically handle the upgrades for those as well. This, again, is part of uh, the add-on capabilities with GKE. And with that, I'd like to welcome up Nick Jakes from Target to talk about how Target is leveraging some of these capabilities. Thanks, All right. Thanks, Zach. Really glad to be here. Uh, my name is Nick Jakes. I am a lead engineer at Target, and I work on our cloud platform team. Uh, my team is responsible for building, managing, and operating the infrastructure and the platform that our application teams at Target deploy on top of. So if you're not familiar with Target, just a brief refresher, uh, we're a nationwide retailer. We have over 1,800 stores. At last count, I think it's 1,845. Uh, 39 distribution centers, and over 350,000 team members. We have headquarters locations across the U.S., uh, but notably in Minneapolis and in the Bay Area here, and we currently rank number 39 on the Fortune 500. <clears throat> in addition to all of our stores and physical locations, we have Target.com and our mobile apps. Now, in terms of virtual square feet, Target.com is our biggest store. Uh, it's visited by 100 million guests per month and is currently the fourth most visited retail site in the US. When people think Target, a lot of people tend to think of traditional brick and mortar retail. However, in the last few years, we've really become a technology company that enables our retail presence both online and in store. And so I'm really excited to share some of that technology that we're using and we put into place with you today. Where I want to start is what Target runs on GCP. <clears throat> now, when we talk about our website, there's a really big component to it that we refer to as non-commerce. And this basically is about 73% of our GCP footprint. Non-commerce is browsing, searching, looking at product information, images, reviews, and activities of that nature. We then have commerce. Now, commerce, as the name implies, is adding items to your cart, checking out, uh, using a payment method like a credit card, and so on. This represents about 27% of our total footprint in GCP, and this is a segment that is subject to regulatory compliance, so security is extremely important here. We also have our developer portal hosted on GCP, so this is where we host documentation for our APIs, as well as self-service mechanisms uh, to renew your API keys and things of that nature. And we host static content, so think of JavaScript and images and things like that, that we can put in GCS and host there and not need to run compute in order to present that to our guests. Next, what I want to do is just run you through some very, very high-level architecture of how we're deployed in GCP and how things work. So this is our non-commerce architecture. We migrated this into GCP in 2017 from another cloud provider. The entire point of this environment is it's a general purpose, general tenancy environment. And we use a model that Google refers to as standalone VPC. So we have three of these large monolithic projects. They're broken out per environment. We have a lab project, a non-prod project, and a production project. And where I'll start with this, if you take a look in the lower right-hand corner, is our data center connectivity. Today, we use Cloud VPN to attach our data centers to GCP, and specifically to a set of subnets that we refer to as platform services. In our platform services subnet, we operate, as the name somewhat implies, services that are common across all of the cloud providers that we operate in. <clears throat> so, for example, we operate service discovery, secrets management, data persistence through Cassandra, and message queuing via Kafka. These services can communicate directly with our data center for replication purposes. Up next, we have our application hosting environment, which is on top. Now again, this is a general tenancy environment, but what's interesting here is this is non-routable to our data centers. So if our applications need to communicate with our data centers, they actually do so indirectly through the platform services that we provide to them. The interesting piece of this is this means our application hosting subnets are air-gapped from our data centers, so that's a little advantageous in terms of security. Finally, in the upper right, 
What happens when we have calls that come in from the internet, they actually traverse our CDN provider and then go to the appropriate load balancer. Now, next up is our commerce architecture. We migrated this in 2018, last summer, and we migrated this from a colo facility. This environment has one primary purpose, and that is to host workloads that are subject to regulatory compliance or have high data security classifications. This requires really strong isolation and segmentation between everything that runs up there. As I change slides, you might have noticed a subtle but very, very important difference, and that is we're using shared VPC in this environment. So I mentioned non-commerce uses three monolithic projects. In commerce, we actually use 56 projects across all of our environments to construct our architecture. <clears throat> what we've done is we've partitioned out all of our applications and all of our platform services into their own individual subnets with their own individual service projects. For data center connectivity, we're now currently using Partner Interconnect, and in another interesting divergence here, our applications can connect directly to our data center workloads. This is particularly important because we run some applications that need to have synchronous callbacks to our data centers in order to complete things like transactions when you're checking out. Otherwise, beyond all of the segmentation, the platform services that we operate are the same, and the applications that we host are generally operating in the same way. Uh, we use Compute Engine, and we use HTTPS load balancers. Our ingress traffic comes through a CDN just like non-commerce. So let's look at a few common pieces. Um, the first one that I want to touch on is the fact that we use Layer 7 HTTPS load balancers in almost all cases. In fact, in over 99% of our load balancer use cases, we use these. We use Cloud Armor and SSL policies, which, I, which I'll touch on a little bit later, uh, to secure our edge. In our platform services environment, we operate proxies and NATs. Now, this is important because our instances, by and large, don't have public IP addresses, but we need a way for these instances to reach out to the internet to hit third-party APIs to do things like address validation, for example. So we operate proxies and NATs, and we install inspection software that can police traffic on these, and we emit those logs to our on-premise SIM for analysis. We use firewall rules in all of our environments, but we take an interesting approach with these in our commerce environment. We use, account, we use firewall rules that are based on service accounts as both sources and targets, and this helps us achieve a level of micro-segmentation when it comes to network connectivity that's allowed. We use private connectivity in all of our scenarios, and I'll touch on specifics about private connectivity a little later on. We use Stackdriver logging and monitoring pretty heavily, Cloud DNS for both public and private authoritative record resolution, and we use Cloud PubSub as a way to move traffic between GCP and our on-premise data centers. So I went through all of that to give you a little context for these next few items that I want to discuss with you. The first one is VPC service controls. Now, Zach already went through a lot of the fine details of VPC service controls, so I'm just going to talk to you about a, a target use case for you. What you see on the screen is a grouping of our commerce projects. And you also see some of our non-commerce projects. Now, we basically have dozens of projects, and these have varying different levels of data security classifications. They also may have varying levels of regulatory compliance that are required. What we don't want to do in these situations are cross logical boundaries, but the problem is, earlier on, last year, these were more imaginary boundaries defined by target policy and not anything concrete. So, for example, if you had the appropriate service account credentials, you could, for example, reach from our commerce environment into our non-commerce environment, look at some stuff that's in the storage there, or vice versa. Now, we don't allow this by policy, but there isn't an actual way to prevent this. So, what can we do to prevent this type of activity? Well, we can use VPC service controls, and we can draw a perimeter around the projects that all have the same data classification. So in this example, we draw this around our commerce projects. <clears throat> what we do then is we disable API access that crosses this perimeter. So this denies the access across the perimeter, both inside and out, and helps us prevent crossing between different data classifications. There's another really big benefit here, and that is what happens if a third party suddenly becomes involved and you're worried about data exfiltration. Now, 
This is basically a nightmare scenario for you. Um, you don't want people to exfiltrate data, and the problem is, once data has been exfiltrated, you really can't put the genie back into the bottle. So data breaches and data loss are a huge concern, and you don't want to lose the trust of your customers. Thankfully, VPC service controls also applies to this particular scenario, so exfiltration attempts can be blocked. So just some key takeaways here. VPC service controls basically helps prevent forms of unauthorized data movement, and that applies regardless of if you control the projects or not. <clears throat> the key here is this helps you prevent that activity from occurring in the first place. Now at Target, we have ways to detect data exfiltration, but once you detect that data has been exfiltrated, it's a little too late. So with a combination of VPC service controls and our detective methods, we feel really comfortable with our security posture. And the great part is, this works regardless of who or what is trying to move this data. So whether you're trying to do it on purpose or maybe take a little shortcut at work because you're about to approach a deadline, it'll still work. Next, I want to talk to you about the interconnect options that we use. Now, I'm going to start with Cloud VPN because when we migrated to GCP in 2017, Cloud VPN was the first interconnect mechanism that we've used. So we've been using it for over two years now. Now, the great part about Cloud VPN is it's relatively inexpensive, it's pretty quick to set up, and it can scale to some pretty reasonable performance. There are some drawbacks if you have really high throughput needs or if you have extremely high demands for reliability, but by and large, it works great. Now, importantly, VPN will typically traverse the public internet, and that means that there can be some issues that will impact your VPN connectivity. So for example, let's say that the red provider here has some sort of issue with their edge and their routes are withdrawn. Now, this can cause a bit of temporary connectivity issues if your traffic was pathed over the red provider. You can also have issues upstream or downstream with capacity because the provider withdrew their routes. And finally, there's a scenario that occurs um, sometimes a little too often, um, and these are route hijacks. Now, these don't necessarily have to be malicious, but they can still impact the stability of your VPN tunnels. So, all said, Cloud VPN actually works pretty well for us in non-commerce because we don't have any synchronous requirements. However, we do need to have higher availability in the commerce environment, and that is because we have synchronous callbacks to our data centers. Any interruptions in those callbacks prevents checkout from working properly, which impacts our revenue. So we wanted to explore a different solution. We moved to Partner Interconnect. And what we do here is we operate a router at our edge. Our router connects to an ISP, who happens to be one of the Partner Interconnect providers. And we have a private, redundant path that avoids the internet and meets back up with Google at its peering edge and goes into the VPC. So this is really helpful in terms of maintaining a very, very high stability environment for critical connectivity. As Shubhika mentioned, it's scalable as well, so you can scale between 50 megabits per second to 10 gigabits per second. Um, and if you're looking to provision things really quickly and you have high bandwidth needs, you can actually provision this a little quicker than direct interconnect in some cases. Um, now, just briefly, I want to talk about Cloud Armor, and what I have here on the screen is an example flow from our guests calling all the way into some resources that we have in GCP. So what happens here is our guest will call to one of our digital properties, and that call will go through our CDN fastly. What will happen here is we'll traverse the CDN. There's a number of things that happen here, web application firewalls or WAFs, routing, caching, and so on. And eventually, that request will make it down to our load balancers through Cloud Armor and into the back end instance. Once that traffic's there, we'll generate a response, and that'll go all the way back out to our guest. Now, the reason this works is we've configured Cloud Armor to allow traffic in from Fastly and a few other approved sources. Our guests, though, aren't aren't the only thing that are out there on the internet. So you can imagine there's some malicious actors out there running port scanners and various other reconnaissance things, and we don't actually want them to hit our services, and they really don't need to in the first place. In fact, we only want Fastly, our CDN, our data centers, and our headquarters locations to be able to hit these load balancers. So when they send traffic, it hits the load balancer, and we're actually able to see this. It's logged in Stackdriver, but the traffic is blocked by a Cloud Armor policy, and those requests never make it to the back end instances. In either case, we see these logs, and we can export them to our SIM for security analysis. 
All right, next up, really quickly, I just want to talk about our use cases for VPC flow logs and firewall logs. Uh, Zach did a great job running through these. There's a lot of, um, you know, rich annotations and metadata that you get with these. Um, but what I thought I'd do is show you a sanitized firewall log example, in case you haven't seen one of these before, um, and just talk through it a little bit. So what we can see in this particular example is we have an instance that's running a service project, and uh, it seems to be a little suspicious. And notably, what we can see happening here is this instance is connecting to an IP address that's out on the public internet, and it's using protocol 17 in port 53. So this is UDP 53 DNS. Now, um, in situations like this, DNS could be used as a command and control mechanism for a botnet, for example. So this isn't really great. Now, the good news is we've actually blocked this traffic with an explicit egress deny all rule that we've set at a really low priority. So we have some other rules that mandate um, having an allow rule in place before that traffic can egress. So we're protected here, but it's really helpful to know this. We take this information and we use Cloud Pub Sub to send it to our on-prem SIM for analysis and alerting. We also can use other syncs and exports like BigQuery or GCS, and we actually export these to GCS as well for long-term retention and in case we need to do any sort of forensic analysis. So looking forward really quickly, I just want to run through a couple of things. Um, over the next year, Target's really looking forward to some enhancements with VPC service controls. There's a piece that we didn't touch on yet called restricted.googleapis.com. It's a slash 30 net block. Now, the real advantage to using this beyond being able to restrict what APIs you can actually talk to um, is it's a slash 30 net block. So it's a much smaller address space to manage than the 19 net blocks that represent Google's public APIs. Uh, so it ultimately results in a reduction in firewall rules and routes um, and other various management overhead. Um, Cloud NAT. Now, managing NATs is toilsome. We do it, and they can be difficult to scale. So we're really looking forward to Cloud NAT, but today we install software on our NATs that inspects traffic, and that isn't available yet in Cloud NAT. So we're looking forward to some potential developments there. And then finally, Google's managed TLS certificates. Target operates over 200 HTTPS load balancers, and that is a lot of certificates to keep track of. So we're going to have some discussions with our internal security teams later this year and see if we can move to these. Now, before I, uh, we move to q and I just wanted to give a shameless plug. A colleague, Nicole, and I will be giving a presentation tomorrow that discusses a little more in detail some of the architecture specifically around shared VPC, VPC peering, and firewall rules that involve service accounts. So if you're interested in seeing this in a little more detail, please join us tomorrow. It should be a lot of fun. And. I know that conferences are busy, so we're going to do Q&A in a little bit here. If you have any target-specific questions and you need to run to your next session, this email address will be active for the next couple weeks, so feel free to shoot me an email address, or shoot me an email, and I'll try to answer it as best I can. And with that, I'll hand things back over to Shubika to wrap things up. Thank you.